So now let me introduce you to our very special guest presenter, Richard Skolnick. Uh, Richard is a lecturer at the uh, Yale School of Public Health and the Yale School of Management. He teaches introductory and advanced global health courses um, in the Yale College, uh, and he has more than 40 years of experience in development and global health work. He spent 25 years at the World Bank, retiring as the Director for Health and Education for the South Asia region. After leaving the World Bank, Richard was the Vice President for International Programs at the Population Reference Bureau and the director for uh, the Center for Global Health at the George Washington University, where he taught undergraduate global health courses for nine years. Um, Richard also served as the executive director of the Harvard PEPFAR program for AIDS treatment in Botswana, Nigeria, and Tanzania. And in addition, Richard has served on a number of international technical and advisory boards. Uh, Richard received a BA from Yale University and an MPA from the Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs at Princeton University. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and uh, turn things over to our presenter, Richard Skolnick. Sophie, thank you very much for the very gracious uh, introduction. I should say that um, it's also, I think it will be interesting for people to know that I teach uh, in introductory courses in global health, not only at Yale College, but I actually also teach uh, a, a somewhat similar course in the Yale School of Public Health. And perhaps more interestingly, in some regards, I now teach an introductory global health course to the Executive MBA program for healthcare executives at the Yale School of Management, which is Yale's business school, possibly one of the very few courses of its type in the world and one that's really interesting and enlightening for me. I wanted to thank everyone very much for joining. It's really an honor and a privilege to be able to join all of you today. And it's especially exciting to know that we have so many people on from several different countries, from all parts of the United States, and from a really wide range of colleges and uh, universities. I'm also pleased to see that a number of my good friends are on, and I'm, I'm humble in their presence since I know that uh, they are themselves really uh, extraordinarily good teachers uh, who I, whose work I have always greatly uh, admired and appreciated. The objectives for today are really not uh, so much for me to speak, which would be silly, but really for us to uh, create an environment in which hopefully we can exchange views about how we try to ensure the best, most fun, most uh, effective, and most efficient achievement of learning outcomes for our own global health courses. So I hope what we can do is have an exchange of views about those approaches, uh, about what we've learned about what works and what doesn't work. I hope we can also help to identify for each, identify for each other different resources and materials, both in people and uh, in, in written and other forms that we can use. And finally, at the end, perhaps we can even agree on or exchange views on um, some different ways in which we might be able to follow up the exchange that I hope that we will have today. So I'm going to make very brief remarks for only about 10 or 15 minutes max, and then really uh, open it up and uh, hope that uh, I can learn a lot, and I hope that we will all be able to learn a lot from each other. Uh, on the slide you see now, I, I provide an overview of some of the approaches that either I've used in my own classrooms and or I've learned from uh, friends before that they use to try to ensure uh, the achievement of learning outcomes in ways that make people really want to come to class, really want to engage in the work, and, uh, and, and uh, inspire some of them as well to see global health as an area perhaps for their future life and work. Uh, at, uh, a number of people, um, as classes begin, actually uh, ask students to read uh, a book, for example, uh, and we'll go into that in order to warm them up in hopes that by the time they come to class, they're really inspired, they're really in the mood, and they're really ready to uh, engage. Quite a few people use videos, and they use them in a variety of forms, sometimes to warm people up, sometimes for teaching. Um, my experience and what I hear from others is that um, quite a few people use cases and a variety of cases, as we'll talk about. I'm just going to go over these quickly now and then um, probe a few more of them in greater detail. 
a fair number of the global health teachers I know who engage in instruction in global health very much like the idea of problem solving, and that is focusing their classes around particular problems and asking students to work together to solve them. Uh, sometimes uh, debates can be really interesting. I'm going to put a little red flag before them as well in a minute. Um, not everyone has the opportunity to twin with other institutions. Uh, at the Yale School of Management, they have a uh, remarkable, as you might appreciate, opportunity, and, and they are twinned with a variety of institutions, and uh, it provides some really exciting and interesting opportunities for students there and elsewhere to learn. And, and I've done that in my undergraduate work as well, both at George Washington and at Yale, and there are some opportunities there. One of the things I do a lot of, especially in New Haven, is um, bring in guest speakers virtually, which we'll also talk about, and then let's see what else people might do. So I, I'm going to take a minute or two and talk uh, about a few of these in greater detail. I, I had never done this before, and after uh, participating in a session at the Unite for Sight conference two years ago, which was reported in one of my blogs, I learned that there were a fair number of people teaching global health who were very, very keen on trying to ensure that prior to the start of classes, their students got warmed up for the class they were going to have. And by and large, they did this in three ways. One was they asked the students to prepare very brief pieces on uh, global health-related activities in which they had engaged and to share those pieces with other students. And some of them used that as a foundation for kicking off the first class. Uh, quite a few people also used uh, videos, and um, usually relatively short ones, often asking students to view a number of them, and had them use that as a basis for walking in the first day and moving right into the material. And more than anything else, I found that there were quite a, we had, I think, 120, 25 participants at the Unite for Sight conference workshop on teaching global health. And um, I, I must say I was somewhat surprised but greatly enlightened by hearing how many faculty used books to warm up their students prior to the start of classes. And you'll see on the slide those books that those faculty used um, most often. Some of you will probably know that there's a new book about the burden of disease study called Epic Measures. I can't imagine a better title in some respects. Uh, it's partly the story of Chris Murray, it's partly the story of the Institute of Health Metrics, and it's partly the story of, um, of the value of burden of disease studies themselves. And that's another one on which I'll be blogging in due course uh, in hopes that that can help all of us exchange ideas about the value or not of that book. Uh, an awful lot of people use videos uh, in classes uh, or in discussion sections related to those classes. Um, there are a number of issues that arise, I think, over using such videos, and one is where do you find them? And as I hope most of you know, uh, on the Global Health 101 website, uh, we have a video list that we've tried to make uh, extensive and which we've annotated as well. Most of those videos are relatively short, but every so often we have a longer one like Bruce Alward's, uh, I think, excellent TED Talk on uh, polio, like Toby Ord's really interesting TED Talk on um, giving to charitable causes. But by and large, I prefer to use myself relatively shorter ones the list that we have isn't the only one. I think it's the most extensive and probably one of the few that's annotated, but there are others as well as, um, as listed here. And um, some of the issues that arise for me is I always go back and forth with myself and my teaching assistants about whether or not we have the students look at these videos before class, uh, whether we should watch them together and ensure that we all have a common platform at the same time for using them as a takeoff point. Uh, whether I should only use videos that are five or six minutes or shorter, or might also use longer ones, and whether or not it's worth using and valuable to have um, videos that focus on someone talking, or it's much more valuable to have videos like one of my favorite ones, which is a video of the total sanitation campaign in Bangladesh, which many of you must know, where little kids run out into the, into the uh, field uh, and whistle if somebody openly defecates, and go get the headmaster, and uh, this has been part of the routine 
in one of the world, world's most successful efforts at reducing open defecation. And I find, in, at least among my students, the students greatly prefer the field-based to the talks. But uh, I wanted to ask you, if you would, uh, to click the participant feedback button if you use videos in your teaching. I'll then let you know the extent to which you do so. And I certainly hope that during the Q&A and the comment session that you will all be kind enough to help uh, enlighten me and other participants about the extent to which you, you use them. Again, please go ahead and click the participant feedback button, kind of one th two thirds of the way down on, on uh, the participant panel. Uh, and it looks just like what you see on the slide. I'm going to go to the next slide. Uh, I, I also found that um, I, mean, I, I use cases of a sort, and quite a few other people that I know who teach global health use cases as well. Um, there are a wide variety of cases available, but what I found over time is I didn't know where all of them were, and I've also found that many of my friends who teach global health didn't know where they were either. And I've tried in this slide to provide a list of some of the easy, most accessible sources of cases that one might use. And I'll just say a few things about how I use them. Uh, I'm, I'm not trained to teach business school. I don't know how. I could never teach at Harvard Business School. I don't know if I'd want to. I'm not equipped to in any case. But uh, I, I'm not very good at using formal cases, except cases that relate to things I really know well, like the case of the Aravind Eye Care Hospital in India, with which I had substantial dealings myself. What I tend to use for cases is uh, articles, a series of articles about a country, a series of articles about um, Rwanda's efforts to achieve community-based health insurance, a series of articles about the Ghanaian efforts to achieve a universal health coverage, a series of articles about uh, results-based financing in Brazil or in Mexico, for example. But more and more, I do see myself assigning some selected cases, even formal cases, to some of my students at different levels, and I found that using them as a takeoff point for discussion has often been quite useful. We've also found, I've also found that um, using the cases from some of the global health case competitions like they have at Emory has been very, very uh, helpful. And in my business school class, I'm actually assigning the whole prize competition, and that's a competition I encourage you to look at. I think it can inspire uh, a number of us to think about um, enlivening the classroom in a number of ways. And I ask my business students, school students, of course, to think of um, entrepreneurial, sustainable entrepreneurial approaches to addressing global health problems like, if you can believe it, uh, reducing maternal mortality in a low-income country in sub-Saharan Africa, or trying to address, as the Hope Prize competition had, the burden of non-communicable diseases in a number of countries um, in the slums of uh, countries such as India or, or Pakistan. Many of you use Million Saved, uh, probably the second edition of Million Saved. I have short versions of the Million Saved cases in, in my own book, and I think this is an area where there's lots and lots of uh, experience. And in case you don't know, uh, the authors of Million Saved are now working on a third edition. The second will remain vibrant and alive, but the third will be much more oriented towards some of the problems that we think the world faces today, like the quest for uh, universal health coverage and like efforts on a population level to address non-communicable diseases. I'm going to turn to the, to the next uh, slide, if I might. And I want, if I might, first, I, now I see how to, how to check the feedback results. Twelve people responded, and of the twelve people responded about whether or not they use videos, ten said yes and two said no. We do a lot of role playing in, in my classes, and I think this stems largely from the fact that I'm really an old technocrat by, by training and a global health practitioner by training, even though I've now been, been teaching global health for 13 years. And it's very common that I might walk into class and pretend to be the Minister of Finance someplace or the w Director General of WHO or the Minister of Health. And I found in all of these years that this is an effective tool for helping students to focus on problems as they might look from the inside out from the point of view of people who live in low and middle income countries, which is the focus of most of my teaching. And I also find that to put students in the position of playing roles 
especially in um, our discussion sections, is I think has al also a always been quite an effective tool for in engaging them. I, I would be remiss, though, if I didn't alert you that um, in places where there's a lot of concern about, forgive me, um, political correctness, one needs to be really, really careful about exercises in role playing because it's easy when one roles plays as a teacher or, or gets the students to do so to wind up uh, inadvertently and accidentally uh, creating offense. So I do this a lot, but I have to tell you I think about it a lot before I do it, and I think about it a lot more before I do it now than I might have done it before. Uh, we use a lot of debates uh, in our discussion sections and occasionally in our classroom sections as well if the class is small enough. I've listed here a number of debate topics that we've had over, we used to say the MDGs are meaningless, but these are some of the debate topics that we've used I think with some success in uh, my own classroom over time and some of these I know are things that uh, others have used, are topics that others have used as well. It would appear to you immediately that some of these will be relatively easier to um, uh, uh, address in an introductory class, and others, for example, the debate about it's not worth eradicating polio uh, would be much harder to do in an introductory class. And I also teach an, a, an upper level case studies um, seminar on global health, and the debate about whether the world should have uh, eradic sought to eradicate polio or measles first is one that I use in that class, but it's certainly not one I use in the introductory class. By contrast, um, when we talk about equity and we give the students opportunities to explore equity issues in a number of countries, I find that uh, my students, both at the George Washington University and at Yale, have certainly been able to engage in really interesting and thoughtful discussions about how good um, Brazil or Indonesia or Mexico is doing at trying to reduce inequities in health in its country. And I find most of the students quite interested and excited by opportunities to discuss and debate issues of health equity within the United States. It would be interesting to know if um, you would, if you could click the uh, participant feedback button indicating whether or not in your classroom instruction you use debates and then I can let people know uh, how we've come out on that. 13 people responded. Uh, and seven say they do, and now it's eight. Eight say they do, uh, and now it's eight say they don't as well, but it's interesting for me to note, and then it was nine. Nine said they did, eight said they uh, did not, but it's interesting, and I'm sure that I certainly have much to learn from those of you who do this as well. There are also some, I'll end by talking about two other really fun things that we do in my classes, uh, and we've done, I, we use these tools both at the George Washington University, and I'm using them in a number of classes at Yale as well. The first is to create an epidemic in the, pl in the classroom. Uh, I don't teach pathophysiology, and my class is much more oriented toward kind of five questions. What's the problem? Uh, how bad is it? What's, what's the problem and how bad is it? Who gets it? Why do they get it? Why should we care? And what can be done, hopefully at least cost as fast as possible, to make the world a better place? Nonetheless, for certain topics, especially tuberculosis, uh, I try to ensure that the students have a good understanding of the nature of TB, how it's spread, et cetera. So I always um, create a TB epidemic in the classroom to help the students get a better feel for um, how tuberculosis uh, can spread, the difference between active disease and latent disease, the difference between, for example, um, pulmonary disease and extra pulmonary disease, the difference between those who have HIV and those uh, who are co-infected with HIV and TB. And um, that's always uh, fun when us to be a little bit careful and remind the students this is just a fun exercise or begin by infecting yourself. But I found this a very, very effective way of helping the students come to grip with those few areas where there's some science that they really have to master. And then we also do for fun at the end of several of my classes what I call a global health hashtag competition. Uh, and I reward the students with a lunch or dinner with me that they're welcome to trade if there are any buyers. But I give the students an opportunity to summarize in song, poems, limericks, short films, et cetera, 
keep global health messages. We have an ind independent group of friends who uh, look at them, and then we award prizes and try to ensure that the student global health groups bring to the attention of others what the competition was about, as well as um, uh, the extraordinarily clever uh, responses that we always get. Uh, I'm going to end by just uh, saying uh, again how grateful I am that all of you uh, have joined, how much I've always learned from others like yourselves and hope to be able to continue doing so. I had been doing a blog for some time but took a break in order to finish the third edition of Global Health 101. But I'm soon going to start blogging again, and I hope in that blog that I will be able to help bring to the attention of those who teach global health the excellent ideas that people like you are so willing to share with each other, others. Uh, I'll look forward to seeing as many of you as possible at the Unite for Sight conference, which I faithfully attend, and perhaps at the conference of the Consortium for Universities and Global Health. Um, I know Jones and Bartlett is willing to maybe twice a year have webinars like this if we find that this is a profitable way of exchanging views. Uh, but I, uh, everyone will get my email at the end, and if it turns out that you're interested, I'm more than happy even myself from time to time, both through the blog and through more direct emailing, to share interesting and valuable ideas that you all might raise. So please accept my renewed thanks, and let me turn it back to Sophie. Great. Thank you, Richard. That was a wonderful presentation. I'm going to go ahead and um, take the control back to control the slides. And um, at this point, we're going to move into the question and answer um, section of the webinar. And um, we, of course, welcome your questions as well as any thoughtful comments you have about how you make your classroom come alive. Um, Richard is happy to, um, to answer your questions as well. Um, and again, there are two options for asking your questions. You can either type them into the chat box uh, on the lower right-hand side of your screen. There's also a, a Q&A box. Um, or if you'd like to ask your question out loud, which we very much encourage you to do so, uh, simply press star 1 on your telephone keypad and Mallory, our operator, will open your line. Um, and Mallory, if, did I explain that correctly? Yes, if you will just press star followed by the number one on your telephone keypad, you will hear a tone acknowledging your request and a prompt to record your name and institution. Okay, and I am actually already getting um, several questions um, coming through on the chat box. Um, the first question is, um, uh, Richard, how do you keep up with key new findings and sources in global health? Okay, well, thank you very much uh, to the person who raised that question. Uh, what I found over time is that there are a number of uh, newsletters and uh, associated with websites that I found to be the best, uh, most useful, and most effective way of keeping up. And although I have a lot of other things to do, as I know you do too, I kind of begin every day by seeing what's included in them. One is the Kaiser Network News Global Health Newsletter. The second is uh, Global Health Now from the Johns Hopkins University. And the third is childsurvival.net and the newsletter that comes from that that's put out by Bob Davis, who's now working for the International Red Cross on measles in uh, Nairobi and who's one of the all-time great vaccination people and a really wonderful friend uh, as well. Uh, uh, each of these uh, has a kind of different focus. Kaiser Fem Network News and Global Health Now focus mostly on the news but partly on uh, new findings and new articles. Bob Davis's newsletter focuses very much on e emerging information, emerging evidence, uh, and interesting articles that have come out on critical issues in global health. Bob also is a, uh, has a great interest in history, and every so, so often from uh, Bob will actually put out uh, uh, an email that looks at historically important articles, like the great debates about um, oral versus injectable polio vaccine. So they're different, and I can't recommend um, the three of them enough to you. I actually encourage my students to look at them as well, and I think uh, the, my, my friends and my students find these websites extremely, extremely helpful. And I know one of the blogs I had, Sophie, and we can remind people in my next blog, 
actually focused in particular on how do you keep up in a world where we're all completely and utterly overwhelmed by the amount of information out there. Uh, Sophie, thank you very much. Back to you. Yep, um, and we've actually got quite a few questions coming through on uh, both the chat and the Q&A boxes here, and a couple about repeating um, the three resources that you just mentioned, which of course, you know, if you want to repeat them now, but we can also uh, potentially provide that in a follow-up email. But what were those three resources again, Richard? So one is the Kaiser Network News. I think it's kff.org. And you can go there and sign up for a wide range of newsletters, uh, many of which might be useful to those of you who teach public health in addition to the global health newsletter, which is specifically oriented toward global health. The second, which is relatively newer, is Global Health Now. Global Health Now, which is produced by folks at the Johns Hopkins University School of Public Health. And the third is a newsletter you can sign up for at childsurvival.net. And, um, and a and daily email will come to you um, from info.something, but you'll be astounded by the value of the articles that Bob Davis will bring to your attention. And I, as Sophie says, we'll be happy to uh, put out this information in writing shortly as well. Great, thank you, Richard. Um, another question, uh, can you talk about some of the ways of incorporating economic factors or global climate impacts? So, um, the, the courses that I teach are very much oriented toward, in a sense, uh, value investing in global health. And that is trying to um, answer the question as much as possible. If one only has $100 to spend, how might one spend it in different settings and at different times in order to try to maximize the health of one's people with a particular focus on the health of poor people and marginalized people. And remember, my course is very much focused on the health of poor people in, in poor countries, as well as certain issues uh, that are more glo they're global, that relate to independence, et cetera. And so without overdoing it and making people feel like cost-effectiveness analysis is the one and only way, I, we, throughout my courses, there's a lot of thinking about uh, global health issues from a kind of economic uh, point of view. Uh, and we also certainly talk when we discuss health systems and try to ensure that the students have a basic understanding of health financing issues, which we explore briefly in my introductory courses and much, much more in my case study seminar because the middle third of my seminar focuses on comparative health systems. Climate change is uh, something I must admit to you I've certainly not mastered at all yet. Uh, in my introductory courses, we look at climate change right now not independently, but we look at it initially as one of the factors that is going that influences and will almost certainly continue to influence the burden of disease. And then as we go through the course, we continue to raise this where it seems uh, relevant. And you will have noticed probably that we have put a um, po policy and program brief in the third edition on climate change, um, which I hope will be a little bit helpful, but I know there's much more to be done. At Yale uh, next semester, uh, Yale College, the undergraduate school, will for the first time be offering a course on global climate, ch on climate change and health. And I believe I should be able to share that with anyone who's in, uh, interested, and I'll, I'll do my best to do that, uh, and we can find a, a forum for collecting names later. I'm very much looking forward to the syllabus for that that my colleague will produce, and I'm hoping that I can borrow some things from him as well. I'm sure that any number of you will have very good ideas, and I hope you'll find a way either today or as a follow-up to share those ideas about um, um, incorporating both topics in your work. So feedback to you, thank you. Yep, um, so we've got quite a few uh, questions coming through on the chat box, but before I read out more of those, I just wanted to go over to Mallory and ask if you have any questions coming through on the line. There are currently no questions from the phone line. Okay, all right, so um, we have a question from um, Krishna from the University of Bedfordshire in the UK. 
Um, and there are several questions. Um, we're thinking of offering our Global Health Perspective Unit uh, through a distance learning route. Any advice that you can offer us in terms of the approach or best modality? Um, uh, this is an area, Krishna, it's a pleasure to meet you and welcome to you from the University of Bedfordshire. It's certainly uh, exciting to see everybody on, but I think you might be among the, the, the farthest away. Um, I, this is an area in which I have very little experience. I've certainly spoken with a number of friends uh, Catherine Jacobson is on the line. Catherine teaches at the George Mason University. Catherine is, uh, I don't want to embarrass her too much, an unbelievably talented epidemiologist and an extraordinarily good teacher. And I believe at George Mason they're now working on developing courses online for global instruction in global health. At the George Washington University they've moved a lot of their, they, they offer a wide range of courses in uh, online. I know University of North Carolina does the same, and I believe even the London School of Hygiene does so as well. The, the only advice that I always have is I'm always very, very interested before I do anything in developing my syllabi to check with my friends and find out what they're finding works, um, uh, what they think is best practice. And people like Catherine and other friends have saved me probably from going over the edge on a number of occasions and always brought very good value. So I wish I had more to add. I offer uh, myself as an intermediary, uh, or we can introduce people directly to you, but I hope those who have experience, and I know Lauren Galvao is on the line from the University of uh, Wisconsin-Milwaukee. Uh, Lauren's a wonderful teacher. Her syllabi uh, are just exceptional. Uh, I must admit to you also, her daughter's an exceptional young lady and one of my students. And I know Lauren and I spoke the other night about efforts that they'll be undertaking to uh, offer some courses online as well. So my advice would be to seek the advice of others, learn as much as you can about best practice, avoid best practice. And I think there's a fair amount going on now, and I think at least in our field, I've always been thrilled by the extent to which faculty were really willing to share in a way I didn't always see in other areas. Uh, Sophia, I hope that's helpful. Please, back to you. Okay. Uh, Krishna has a couple of other questions. Um, can you talk a little bit about the relationship between global health and health systems uh, around the world? Um, so, Krishna, thank you again for this question. My own experience suggests that different uh, instructors treat the question of health systems in, um, in many, many different ways. Some treat it right up front. Uh, some set a foundation on cross-cutting issues and then look at health systems before they move into topical issues like women's health, children's health, um, non-communicable diseases, communicable diseases, as you'll see in my own syllabus. Um, uh, I think some of the important questions for those of us who treat introductory courses is just how far do we go in, in um, trying to enable the students to learn about health systems. What countries are the best examples when there are so many from which to choose? What are the main points that one wants to help the students to understand? Is it issues of the quest for universal health coverage? Is it issues of the critical issues that confront the health systems of low and middle income countries in particular? Is it the uh, difficulty that uh, all countries may face as they age in trying to ensure that they can actually pay for care? Um, it, is it the relationship between how health systems work and how they can specifically uh, promote good health in selected areas? So um, I try in my own courses to have uh, out of um, 26 sessions, uh, somewhere between three and four that focus on health systems issues that try to um, help the students understand pretty much the, the topics that I was mentioning to you and to gain a more global perspective on looking at the different ways in which health systems are organized, the way they function, the critical issues they face, and some of what we're learning are ways that even low and middle income countries can address those issues effectively and efficiently. In my upper level course, it's completely different, as I mentioned, because a third of the course is explicitly oriented toward being as close as one could come at, um, to an abbreviated version of a course on, uh, on comparative health systems. And uh, I'm sure 
that any number of the people uh, on the webinar today will have very, very thoughtful views about how they treat health systems. The only other thing I would say is that, of course, as we go through the term, after those four uh, sessions that are specifically oriented toward health systems, as we go through the term, I try my best to keep relating what we're doing to critical health systems issues and relating those issues to the topic at hand. Um, I've tried this a bunch of different ways. For me right now, that's the most effective so far with my introductory courses, but I certainly look forward to hearing from all of you about the manner in which uh, you, you're trying to um, uh, engage in thinking about health systems in your own courses. Sophie, thank you. Back to you. Okay. Um, we have a question um, about the books that you suggested. Um, this person noticed that uh, most of the books suggested are ethnographies and wondered if others use an ethnography um, or extended case study to teach global health. Uh, it's a question I think Sophie will have to leave to the, um, to the, to the group um, as a whole, and I hope people will be happy to share views on it. If they should choose, I mean, if they should choose to use the book Epic Measures, it, it, that's not an ethnographic book. I mean, it's a book about Chris Murray, the search for measures that can help us to make sounder health policy, et cetera. Um, it, I mean, I certainly, in my case studies course, I uh, used Bill Fagey's course, House on Fire. And as we were preparing for the webinar, I was thinking in many respects, that's a really wonderful, very insightful, very, I find, moving book written by someone who's certainly a great public health hero, and those who've met him will know he's also a truly great and, and humble uh, person. And I was thinking that I, I might, even among all those other books, uh, ask students um, to read House on Fire before they come to even my introductory class. I also think at the end of House on Fire, Bill Fagey outlines um, better than anyone ever has, in my view, if you could only know a few lessons from the experience of public health and global health today, what are those most important takeaway uh, lessons? And, and that's another one, and I will be happy um, to think more about this, collect more ideas from my friends and, uh, and all of you, and try uh, very shortly in another blog to talk about books that we've all found useful. Um, let, let me give it back to you, uh, Sophie, with, with thanks to all. Great. Um, and I will also ask Mallory um, in case there are any questions on the line. We have a question from Julius Arcaderer. Uh, yes, good afternoon. Hello. Yeah, good afternoon. Hello. Hi, thank you for your question. Yes, I'm from King University, Union, New Jersey. I was wondering if uh, Mr. Skone could share his uh, contact information with, with us, just in case if we need to contact him in the future. Uh, Julius will be happy to do so at the end. Sophie will be providing everybody with my email. Um, I'm honored to tell you that you would be astounded if you knew how many faculty from all over the world actually get in touch with me and have been very generous in sharing their ideas as well as sometimes seeking my own. Uh, I also get uh, emails from students all over the world, some of whom especially like chapter 18 and 19, which I hope you found have saved you a lot of time in sensible ways, but who uh, somebody said uh, ought to get in touch with me in hopes that I might give them a few minutes. I, I try my best to respond to everybody and to do so expeditiously. So um, as insane as it might sound, or certainly my wife thinks so, please don't hesitate if you think that uh, there's something with which I might be able to help you only because I've done this uh, taught a lot, or, or if you have good ideas that you think I might be able to help you disseminate to others, I'm more than welcome hearing from all of you. I'm always trying to make my courses better, and I might hope at the same time that I might play a small role in intermediating knowledge among all of us. So you'll have the email, Julius, and it's a pleasure to meet you. Thank you. All right, great. Thank you, Julius. And I would also remind everyone that if, you, if you'd like to voice your question, you can press star 1, and Mallory will, uh, is queuing up 
um, the questions on the, on the voice line, um, or you can enter your question into the chat box. Um, I am seeing a couple of questions about getting access to the PowerPoint slides, and yes, of course, we will be um, following up after the session with um, a copy of the slides. Um, as well as our contact information if you have further questions um, and uh, within uh, 48 hours uh, a full recording of the session. Um, uh, do you have Sophie, it, yes. it's Richard. Uh, I, see, I see one question that I think is really interesting. Would you mind if I went ahead and, and read it and took it? Yep, absolutely. I, I was about to, to read a couple more. Okay, things. thank you so much. <laughs> there's, there's, there's another thoughtful question from Krishna at the University of Bedfordshire that uh, says, people these days often talk about ethics and global health, are there are specific ethical issues that are only related to global health. Uh, I'm not sure of that, Krishna, but I'm going to tell you um, what I do and what I've learned from some others who know the field much better than me. Um, wh one of the topics on which we focus attention, you'll certainly see it in Chapter 4 of my book, is the ethics of resource allocation. And uh, I got wonderful help in writing Chapter 4, I'm, I must say to you, and I've acknowledged it repeatedly, from both a friend of mine who's a lawyer who's worked a lot on human rights, Rudy von Pembroke, as well as Joe uh, Millam, who's a bioethicist. Certainly I've learned a lot also from Don Winkler and uh, the two Dons at Harvard and from Norm Daniels as well, and the chapter that um, the Harvard professors had in the disease control priority number two. So we have a really interesting um, session in my introductory classes where we specifically focus on ethics, and that's specifically focused as well on the ethics of uh, allocating scarce resources um, under under constraints. And what I do is I have a case that I, I believe is on the, on the website, and if not, we can triple check and put it up. And it looks at a country like Malawi in 2006, 2007 when they first got access to antiretroviral therapy. And the, teach, the instructor plays the president of Malawi, and the students play an advisory committee. And you ask the students to advise you after their discussion on, how, on what criteria and principles should govern the allocation of these um, AIDS drugs to people in your beloved country, given that there are 10,000 people who even then were clinically eligible but your American friends have given you only 5,000 courses of treatment for the year. It, you will all immediately recognize it's not that different from the organ donation case, but I found year after year after year, and with some modifications, that this is a really interesting uh, case, and the students often leave the class and say they've got a throbbing headache, that the headache isn't going to leave for a long time, but it's a headache that they welcome because they just never thought about some of these issues in this way. And then, if I may, Krishna, one of the other issues that comes up all the time are issues um, that we don't necessarily cover as a formal part of the class, but um, students constantly raise issues, of course, about um, what, are the, what are the ethics of development assistance work? What are the ethics uh, or the lack of ethics in uh, volunteerism by students? What are the ethics or lack of ethics in medical missions? And I find students um, more at Yale than at George Washington, but at both places for sure, extremely interested in pursuing this, often with very strong views, sometimes based on more thought than, uh, than, than not. Uh, and I have a series of lunches throughout the year in which we spend a lot of time going over these. You'll also find one other interesting ethical issue I'm sure you've all seen, which is students who come from Anthro 101 believe deeply in cultural relativism and want to tell you from the beginning how hegemonistic any notions of even global health are. And one of the things that I do the first day of class is say to people immediately, how many of you think that women in Saudi Arabia should be allowed to drive? How many of you think girls in Afghanistan should be allowed to go to schools of sufficient quality and long enough that it will enable them to be all that they can be? How many of you believe female gender mutilation is a good thing? And they all realize, and they have in every one of the classes I've taught everywhere, that these actual ethical issues are really not black or white. They're very nuanced and that they're in their heart of hearts, whether they're in Nigeria, they're in Ghana, they're in Kenya, or they're in the U.S., these are difficult issues that um, they tend to have strong views on but have never thought about quite that, that way. And I um, 
I would probably encourage you all to do some of the same as well as share ideas on how you treat the range of ethical issues that, uh, that come up. And lastly, I would say certainly there's a wide range of issues that come up when one speaks about equity and inequality, uh, and, um, and those, of course, go throughout uh, the term as well. So, Krishna, I thank you again, and I look forward to learning more from you about this. Sophie, thank you, and back to you. Sure. Um, I do have a few more questions coming through, um, and I think this one you, you may have partially answered this. Um, do you compare the population of different countries and the economic status of the comparing con countries to address differences in global health problems? Uh, Sophie, this is really fundamental to uh, everything that we do. Um, very early on in the class, I try to ensure that my students have a really profound understanding of the burden of disease globally and how it varies by country income group, how it varies in, in some respects by countries, especially those that are outliers, and how it is that Liberia might as rapidly as possible have a burden of disease that looks more like um, Colombia and then more like Sri Lanka and then more like Norway, even if that might take a long time to come. I want my students, if I point to a map and say, what's the burden distribution of the burden of disease by group one, group two, and group three, to be able to tell me more or less that, certainly by broad country income groups. And it's hard for me to understand how they could make their way through the rest of what we want to do if they didn't have a very good understanding of that. And at the same time, we talk about, we have a module on demography. And while I'm not trying to enable my students to become demographers, I want them to have a good understanding of basic principles of demography and enable them to understand how those relate to the burden of disease that is, as it exists today and how it might exist um, later. And uh, on my exams, I don't want to punish students who don't know the GNP per capita of country X, Y, and Z, and I don't expect them to. But certainly as we get going in the course, I want my students to be at least junior uh, development students, students of development who have a better and better understanding as we go along uh, in seeing the, the economic, socioeconomic status of different countries in the world, how they compare, how demographic uh, profiles look for those different kinds of countries, and how the burden of disease looks as well. So this is completely, utterly fundamental to what I do, and then it runs throughout the course even after we've set that foundation. Uh, Sophie, I, I hope people don't mind my, <laughs> my enthusiasm. Back to you. Yep, I, I'm sure they don't. And we, have, uh, we definitely have more questions here. I have one coming through. Um, can you give some examples on how you deal with a class, how do you deal with a class of undergraduates from different levels? So this, 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 this is a, all of these are really wonderful questions, and certainly this is one I'm sure everybody has to wrestle with. Um, I've been very fortunate in teaching students at the George Washington University who have remarkable opportunities compared to many students, at least to intern in Washington, D.C., for people of great talent and to learn a lot, and sometimes to go away in the summers and participate in uh, experiential learning and global health. Yale, of course, is a, a wonderful fairyland uh, of the 10,000 students at Yale at all levels. 1,200 last year went away uh, with Yale money, if you can believe it. This is something almost none of us could possibly dream of. And yet, even in my Yale classes, now I have freshmen, sophomores, juniors, and seniors. I have students who spent three summers in, um, engaged in global health experiences. I have students who are taking this because they want to enlighten their perspective and be more global, but who have no experience at all in working in health, et cetera. So what I try to do is look at what I think ought to be a common core of learning competencies with which I would want them to emerge at the end, and then I provide readings that I hope will help them to get that. We provide uh, policy brief assignments that help them to deepen their understanding of selected assignments. We have discussion sections at Yale that I didn't have at the George Washington University, and we use those for exploring cases and pursuing other topics in greater depth. And then I have supplemental reading lists that I provide to students, and I offer students opportunities if they're especially interested in pursuing topics in some depth and meeting with me um, uh, often in groups to talk more about um, 
trying to reduce intimate partner violence? What have we learned? What's the latest and newest and new drugs, diagnostics, and vaccines for TB and some other infectious diseases? So um, this, this, is, this is a difficult one, and I admit to you we just did a midterm evaluation, and while most of the students, especially freshmen and sophomore, thought that the level of the course was appropriate, there were certainly, um, certainly upperclassmen, some of whom were quite experienced, um, but had no conceptual framework for thinking about global health, who really thought that the course needed to be more, um, more profound. Uh, and uh, th this is a tough one. That's how I do it. I'm sure that all of us can learn a lot from each other about trying to um, ensure that one can captivate all of one's students, regardless of how much experience they, uh, they, they have. Sophie, back to you. I have another question here about the use um, or details about uh, how you structure role playing and debates in large classes, for example, 100 students. Yeah, I, I, I would be crazy if I didn't admit to you how much more difficult that is if you don't have discussion sections in addition to the, uh, to the large session. But from time to time, even in our, uh, I have had to teach largish, large, largish and, and last year 132 students. And for a small number of sessions where we thought it was feasible, we actually divided the group into uh, teams, pardon me, of 10, assigned them uh, different topics, and had five of them report for, let's say, six minutes or so and then had a discussion around their reporting. We always do that for the ethics module. We often do it as well for health systems where five of the teams will report on um, different health systems, which allows us to cover a larger number of the basics on different health systems than we would be able to do otherwise. And then five teams might report uh, uh, in this session, another five next time, and another five after that. So for the debates and the breaking up into smaller groups, that's how we've done it. Uh, it is much easier when I have 41 in one class now and 66 in another. I teach back-to-back -back introductory courses. The role playing, I find, um, as an old technocrat who's worked in global health for so many years, this is instinctive to me and I found, I, I think at least with my students, it's been a valuable way of uh, teaching. Um, I run very, very interactive classes, and in many classes I will walk in as a minister or a director general or an assistant director general or the president of Skolnick Land and try to enable an, a discussion. I admit to you freely, I did not enjoy last year as much as I enjoyed all previous years and I'm enjoying this year because I can't lecture. It's not who I am. It's not what I do. And uh, trying to be interactive while walking up and down a, a lecture hall, no matter how beautiful the hall was, uh, was very, very uh, difficult. So the only other suggestion I could give you besides um, what, what I've done is I found that the physical space made a huge difference. I have a classroom night now that uh, I have 66 in one class, but the room is, has only seven um, rows of chairs. And so there's not much distance between me and the students at the back. Uh, I know all of the students by name. I do that by giving them name cards at the beginning. And I found that even in that group, I'm able to engage in the interactive style that I know best and at which I'm best uh, as well. So these, these are a few things, and I'd certainly love to hear from others. Um, but, um, I mean, one could lecture in a role uh, if one had a good enough feel for it. I, I remind you how careful in some settings we need to be these days, but I think for some students in some places, this could actually probably be uh, a very effective way of teaching as well. But on all of these, I very much look forward to learning from all of you. Please, please go ahead. Great. Thank you, Richard. And I do see that um, we are right at the one hour mark. I, I want to be respectful of everyone's time. We do have um, at least three more questions here. Um, and I think what I'm going to do at this point um, is to take at least one more question. I, I, I just first want to show um, on screen here um, that uh, www.globalhealth101.com um, is an excellent resource. If you don't already have a copy of the book, you can uh, go to that website and request a complimentary review copy. If uh, perhaps you're using the second edition and you'd like to 
switch to the third or maybe using a different resource altogether. Um, this book was just published in August. Um, you can download sample chapters um, on uh, globalhealth101.com as well, and you can also request access to ancillary materials such as the test bank and PowerPoint lecture slides. Um, and then one final thing I would say is um, if you do have questions, please feel free to email me directly um, if it's regarding uh, getting a copy of the book or the instructor resources or anything like that. Um, Richard also welcomes your questions directly. If you'd like to email him um, directly, you can do that. Um, and I think at this point I will take, um, read out one more question here, Richard, if you have time for that. So that would be fine. I just want to remind people, um, I hope I sound quite informal, and I am, so I hope in any communications you'll just feel free to say teacher to teacher, Richard, please, please don't call me by titles that I don't deserve. <laughs> And I don't have. My son's a real doctor, and you could call him doctor, but you don't need to call me one. Thank you. Okay. Um, so we have a question from someone from North Carolina Agricultural and Technical State University, um, and she is currently teaching a global health course online, and she says that her students find the policy and program briefs in your book to be very informative. How do you decide on which ones to include? Well, thank you very much for the very gracious comment. I think this is from Professor Usochu, if I understand correctly. I, I hope you don't mind. I, I, I'm sorry, I, I didn't mean necessarily to do that, but I'm, I'm touched and honored that you would say that. So what I, what I try in, in real time to keep up with critical issues of the day and um, and uh, in conjunction with a few students that I have working for me uh, all the time, uh, and I, I mean literally working for me for pay, um, I, I, I say that because I worry about people who have too many student helper, helpers who they don't reward. But in any case, on a real-time basis, I'm trying to keep up. I'm, I think on a real-time basis about what is it that I think among the many, many things students really ought to get a better feel for, and then I try every so many months uh, to put together a policy and program brief that could later be brought into the book on those issues that I think are so fundamental and often on issues where I think they may not get a good feel on their, um, on their own. So those are the decision criteria. And I would certainly welcome hearing from any of you uh, any suggestions at all. Uh, we're talking now with our friends at Jones and Bartlett about the possibility as new and exciting issues emerge, like whether or not the new malaria vaccine gets put into, um, gets, implement, gets put into, gets used, that we might actually be able to have an update page on Global Health 101, and we would add additional policy and program briefs to those. But I more than welcome any suggestions at any time from any of you about specific areas where you think these policy and program briefs could be useful and then I'd be more than happy to put them together now, um, share some of them now, and then later we would move them into the new edition. And I thank the um, professor for the question, and I apologize again in my excitement for uh, saying your name if it was something you didn't necessarily want me to do. Thank you, Richard. Um, Okay, well, at this point, we do have a couple more questions, and I, I see that there's still quite a few participants on the line. Um, Richard, do you have time to answer two I, more questions? I, I, I hope I'm not giving people a headache, and I'm looking forward to learning from them, but I'm all, I'm all yours, Sophie. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm all everyone's. Okay. Um, so from the same... Um, uh, instructor from North Carolina Agricultural and Technical State University. Um, she would like to know more about the use of debate in your introductory course. So, um, when I was at the George Washington University, we had an hour and 15 minute sessions twice a week. We had no discussion sections. Uh, Yale and some places like it are more used to lectures and they're not so used to classes even with 50 or 60 which are interactive. So remarkably, not only do I get two hours and 30 minutes of contact and two one hour and 15 minute sessions, but in addition, we also have a 50 minute discussion section led by teaching assistants. And uh, uh, I thank goodness for the teaching assistants I have who are spectacular and all former students of mine. Both in the classes 
uh, classroom itself and sometimes in the discussion sections as well, we use these debates. And what I normally do is actually ask, I always ask the students in advance to prepare both sides of the debate. I never tell them in advance what side of the debate they will be on. And then when they come to class, we divide them into the different teams. In a larger classroom, if you felt that it would work, you could pick five people or so from each of two teams, divide the class into background supporters for each of the two teams, and after a certain amount of time and when they've made their case and had some rebuttal, open it up to rebuttal while continuing to play those roles. In our discussion sections at Yale, which are relatively small, always 18 students or fewer, we do lots of uh, debating, and there we generally follow exactly the same format. We give out the topic in advance. We assign readings in advance to assist them and pre to prepare. We give them readings on both sides of the debate, and then we handle the debate just as I mentioned. And um, by and large, our students have done a good job of preparing. I think we believe that they've learned more by being forced to think about both sides of the debate. And certainly for any of us who believe that we want to avoid ideology and, current, and encourage our students to think about an evidence base for their work, enabling them to think about more than one side of a problem is probably a good thing. So that, that's how we handle it, and I'm sure others do it in different ways as well. Okay, great. Um, and we actually have a comment here um, about the case studies, um, that they're very helpful to students to understand global health issues, and um, this person is very appreciative of the new ones in the latest edition of Global Health 101 and is asking where can they get more case studies. And of course, I'm thinking right away of the companion case book, um, Million Saved. Um, Richard, can you touch on that a little bit? Right, Sophie, one of the slides that I put up, um, I don't have the numbers in, in front of me. I, I can control it, right? There we go. Uh, um, let me back. back control to you. Thank you, yeah. there we go. So you'll, you'll see in this slide, um, there may well be uh, more um, uh, sources for cases than this, but these are some of the sources that I've actually had an opportunity to look at. Most Harvard Business School cases are generally not in the public domain, as you know, uh, but uh, th these other cases are all in the public domain. And um, I found a number of them very, 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 very useful, even though, as I mentioned, I don't teach anything like the business school style of using these cases. So I would encourage you initially to take a look at some of these. Um, some of them can be used exactly as they are. For some others, you might have to sit down for a half hour and actually make it into your own little one-page case. But these are certainly some of the cases that I believe are readily accessible and can be quite helpful to you. And I mentioned in due course there'll be an additional um, 21 or so, I think, cases from millions saved when the next edition of that will, will come out. Uh, finally, um, the Disease Control Priority Third Edition um, for the Disease Control Priority 3rd Edition, they're not only producing volumes, but there'll be a Lancet paper for each new volume as it comes out. And some of those are linked to commissions that, to my um, really pleasant surprise, actually produce some cases as well. And uh, that was the case, for example, with the Lancet Commission on Global Surgery. So these are some of the places you might start. But if you just Google cases, um, public access cases on global health, you will probably be pleasantly surprised and find a fair amount of materials you can use. Sophie, back to you. One final question on the chat box, um, but before I go to that, uh, could I ask Mallory, just in case there's anything on the line? There are no questions from the phone line. Okay, one final question for you, Richard, is um, how can you get people to guest speak virtually for you? Uh, that is a good question uh, as well. So some of us are hanging around Washington, D.C., or have been here for years, or worked as technocrats in international organizations, and then it's not so hard. For others who are in places that aren't Washington, D.C., that aren't London, that aren't Geneva, uh, it is absolutely much, much harder. And it's also harder because some of the people you want to speak are the same people that everybody else wants to speak as well. But um, my, my Probably my most useful suggestion would be um, if you're not so familiar yourself 
with some of the important actors. Uh, I, I would actually try to contact some of them directly. Uh, you'll read in Chapter 19 about some. You can go to the authorship of some of the Lancet series. You can go to the authorship of some of the cases. And even if you begin uh, your email to them by saying, you know, dear so-and-so, I can't, I can't imagine how busy you are, and yet I know how profoundly my students would be affected if I could bring you into the class for a half hour virtually to talk about the latest trends in tuberculosis as they look from the WHO Stop TV point of view. Uh, I think from time to time one might actually find such people responsive. And the other way for sure is if you don't know people but you know people who do, then I think to tap your friends in a kind of cascading way and say, who, I'm really looking for someone to speak um, on topic A, B, or C and to join my classroom from uh, the Health Protection Agency of the UK, from WHO, from USAID. And I think if people are judicious in their requests that some of these folks will actually be flattered uh, to do so. I've also found after a fashion that it can work very, very well, even with primitive, forgive me, technology, where you just take your computer and point it at your classroom uh, and uh, and um, uh, sorry, and you point it at your classroom while the person appears on that screen. Uh, and uh, I think it's much, much easier. I spoke recently at McGill via Skype, uh, and uh, I think we, I hope you'll hear we had a, a wonderful session. For part of it to save bandwidth, they actually didn't let me see the students. That was much harder as it is today. So I would encourage you to point the camera of your computer to your students, let your speakers see the students, put him or her up on a big screen, and um, you know, probe some of the people written up in the book, in the Lancet series, others you know working at different uh, institutions within countries themselves. Uh, 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 you'll, you'll find, I think, officials uh, who, if they had sufficient bandwidth, which would be, who would be thrilled to talk about uh, health reform in Ghana or health reform in Rwanda or results-based financing in Mexico from the point of view of the Mexican Public Health Institute, but they can't do it that much. So uh, I hope others will share ideas on this as well, but I would encourage you, uh, I think it can add enormously to the classroom, especially if you're in places where you can't just have your friends walk over to lunch, as I was certainly very, very fortunate to be able to do in Washington, and I'm not able to do it in New Haven, and I use virtual, uh, I get my friends on virtually all the time now in a way that I could do uh, personally before. Sophie, back to you, thank you. Great, thanks Richard. Uh, I think at this point we're gonna start to wrap up the session. Um, uh, like I mentioned at the beginning, uh, I will send along a follow-up email uh, with a full copy of the slide deck here. Um, I know that there are a few other questions that came through that we weren't able to answer, and um, I have uh, a record of everything, and we will certainly try our best to get back to you with questions, but we also encourage you to um, email us directly uh, with your questions, and I will put this final slide uh, with my email address as well as Richard's. Um, if you want to make a note of that, um, feel free to email us at any point. Um, Richard, thank you very much for your talk today and for answering everyone's questions. That was fantastic. Um, and thank you all for attending and uh, participating with your responses and your questions. Uh, and with that, I'm going to go ahead and ask Mallory to end uh, the session and, and close the line. Okay, thank you all very much as well, and I look forward to keeping up with everyone. This concludes today's conference call. You may now disconnect. Presenters, please hold.